Good morning, morning church. Morning also to those of you joining us online. I have landed this preaching assignment in possibly the messiest week of my year thus far. So last Saturday, uh, one of my Brazilian missionary friends flew into Singapore from Timor-Leste urgently because she needed medical treatment. So I was involved in helping to provide some care for her. She needed a place to stay. And my co-founder is actually visiting Timor-Leste now, so her flat is empty. So I said, okay, my friend, our friend can, can stay in that flat, but she can't be left alone because she's not well. So I moved out of my, my place to stay with this friend. So over the past week, um, I was staying somewhere else, trying to settle her meals and her transport to the hospital, and there were other people helping as well. So it's been quite a chaotic week for me. And... At the first service, you know, I was, during worship, I was saying to the Lord, it's been very disruptive, right? I feel like my headspace is not centered. Um, but I felt the Holy Spirit tell me, caring for your friend in need is the gospel. It is not a disruption. And I share this because many of us here may be caregivers. You may be caregivers for elderly parents, elderly in-laws, elderly spouse children with special needs and I think I just want to say thank you for your hard work in caring for others. It is the gospel lift out. And I want to appreciate all the caregivers and um, just to let you know that the Lord appreciates you as well. So the topic of my sermon today is freedom to choose. This sermon has been through a lot of revisions uh, in the process of preparing for it but I'm going to trust that this version that I've landed on is something that God will use to speak to us. Shall we pray as we start? Father, like what Pastor Susan reminded us, we want to pour out our love, our affection, our time, and our focus attention at your feet, Lord Jesus, this morning. We pray and invite your Holy Spirit to come. Give us wisdom and understanding, God. And as your word is preached, we remember you have promised that your word does not return to you void. So I pray that your word will be good seed that falls on good soil. And may you encounter us, teach us your truth, and may we experience more of your presence in our lives, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. The first thing I want to do is to set a context that God has always valued man's freedom to choose. We know that in the beginning of time when God created Adam and Eve, they were given a choice. They were told not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it was a choice that they had. From the beginning, God allowed men and women to choose. And this was something important to Him. Later on, we read that in the founding of the nation of Israel, if you trace back to the beginning, it really started with Abraham's free choice to leave his father's land. He was told by God, leave your father's house, Go to a land that I will show you. And we are familiar with how it ends, right? That Abraham went as the Lord had told him. And out of that act of obedience, out of that free choice, then came a whole series of events that led to the formation of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. At the end of Joshua's life, he gathered the nation of Israel, the elders, the leaders, and he gives them this challenge. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Very clearly, a choice was given to Israel to renew their covenant commitment to the Lord. And in the New Testament, we are familiar with the way Jesus related to many people who came after Him. They wanted to follow Him. And to all these people, Jesus gave them the choice. If you want to be my disciple, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. And we know from the Gospels that some did, some didn't, like the rich young man. So it was a free choice that Jesus gave to everybody who came after Him. Now, for the next few slides, for the next few moments, we're going to play a, a game or a simple experiment. You're going to be making a series of choices, okay? 
A or B? Would you choose 10 Singapore dollars, A or B, 100 Singapore dollars? Okay, I give you a permission to chat with your friend, your partner next to you. Tell them what you would choose. It's not a trick question, okay? I hear A quite resoundingly. And why? Tell your, tell your friend or your partner why you choose what you choose. Now, it's not a trick question. I think all of us would choose B, which is $100 rather than $10. Why? Because it has more value. You can get more goods and services in return for $100 than $10. Okay? Quite clear. No brainer. Now, for the next few slides, the rule is you cannot Google, okay? Let me tell you this before I show you the next few slides. Now, before that though, let me just round up this first question. We will always choose what is more valuable to us, right? So it's a no-brainer. $100 has more value than $10, so we will all choose $100. Now, next. A is 50 dirham. It is the currency of the United Arab Emirates. And then B is something we're more familiar with, 10,000 Korean won. Okay, I see frowns. Go ahead and tell your partner which you would choose. Cannot Google? Make a choice. And say why, right? You guys are very excited. <laughs> more so than the first service. Okay, I don't know how many people choose, would choose A. Okay, okay, B. And I'm sure there are all kinds of reasons. Huh? Now, in terms of monetary value, A is actually worth more in Sing dollars. Okay, 50 dirham actually works out to 18, just slightly over 18 Sing dollars, whereas 10,000 Korean won is about 10 Sing dollars. So A actually has more value. Now, I want you to consider what was going through your mind and your emotions as you were trying to make this choice. Compared to the first one, this one is a little bit more difficult, right? Harder to choose. Okay, let's continue. 200 Egyptian pounds or 50 manat. Okay, what is the manat? It is the currency of Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is an ex-Soviet republic bordering Russia and Iran. Okay? Now, which will you choose? 200 Egyptian pounds or 50 manat? I see some of you shaking your head, a lot of question marks flying over your heads. Okay, at this point, consider how you feel, okay, as you're trying to make this choice. Now, what is the answer? 50 manat is actually worth more money. Okay, it works out to... 40 Sing dollars, quite a lot of money. And then 200 Egyptian pounds is actually just about $6. Okay, now let's take a step back and, and consider what was happening, right? As you were trying to make these choices, what was going through your mind? It got so-called more difficult, right? Yeah, up to a certain point, maybe it became a random guess. You really were, were you didn't know what, what's happening. What this shows us is that when we have trouble choosing, it's because we are not sure of the value of one or all of the options. Am I right? Sing dollar, easy peasy. We all know which one is worth more. When it came to the other currencies that you were less familiar with, you realised that you don't know how to choose. Now, I want to relate this back to our lives. When you have trouble making choices in life, it points to the fact that you are not sure of the value of either one or all of the options available to you. We're going to look at some choices of these three biblical characters, Abraham, David, and Paul. As we read some passages, I would like you to think what were the choices before them, and more than that, to drill down into what were the values behind those options. Right? And may I also invite you to as you read these passages, relate it back to your life. Perhaps you are facing some situation in your life 
and you need to make some choices and you are in that place of trying to weigh up your options. As we read these passages, consider if the Lord might be speaking to you. Now, the first text is taken from the life of Abraham quite early on after he has journeyed on. And this is when he and his nephew Lot have decided to part ways because they have too much livestock and there's competition and they decide that it's better to part ways. So we pick up the dialogue at this point in Genesis chapter 13, starting from verse 8. Then Abraham said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me, between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, in the direction of Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are. Northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. Now let's pause here and look at what's happening. Abraham, as the elder, had the right to choose first. All of us are, as Asians understand this intuitively, that you need to give honour and preference to your elder. And Abraham was Lot's uncle. So what was really happening and what were the two choices that Abraham had? He could have chose first and choosing first means I will pick the best for myself. I get to pick first what I want. Letting Lot choose is actually to say, never mind, God will give me what is mine and on top of that, I believe that it is good. It is good. Therefore, I'm okay to let Lot choose first. These were really the two choices before Abraham. So Lot chose first, Abraham was gracious, and he chose instead God's best for him, rather than insist on his rights. Abraham chose God's best for him, rather than insist on his rights. Let's move on to the next story about the life of David. And again, let me give you the context before we read this verse. This is when David had ordered a census of Israel and Judah and God was angered. And then there was a plague that happened. The prophet Gad says to David, you need to build an altar at the threshing floor of this man named Aruna. So the, we pick up the dialogue here. David the king is on his way to meeting Arauna, who is the owner of this property. Right? And we join them in this conversation. So Arauna sees the king coming and he says, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? David said, To buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord, that the plague may be averted from the people. Then Arauna said to David, Let my lord the king take and offer up what seems good to him. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering and the threshing sledges and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. All this, O king, Arauna gives to the king. And Arauna said to the king, May the Lord your God accept you. But the king said to Arauna, No, but I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. What were the two choices available to King David? He was king and he had the power and authority to do whatever he pleased. And on top of that, we, it's clear that Arauna was very willing to, to give the land and the oxen free to the king. David could have just taken it all free for charge. 
and he would have gotten a very good deal. Paying for it, however, meant David would have to pay the price. And it would mean that he wanted to sacrifice unto God. And he says that you know, in the dialogue preceding, I will not offer something to the Lord that cost me nothing. His choice was to choose sacrifice unto God rather than personal gain. Let's look at this text from Philippians chapter 3. And here is Paul talking about his background to the church of Philippi. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. If LinkedIn existed in Paul's time, he would have a profile and a CV that was excellent. Right? He had, and he worked hard. He worked hard to establish himself as a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He studied under the famous Jewish rabbi Gamaliel. And what was the choice that he had to make when he encountered Christ? He could have just remained a Pharisee, turned away from Christ. To remain a Pharisee means he will continue to live a life in which he will be so respected and honoured. He will be such an important man in Jewish religious circles and enjoy all the privileges that came with that status. But to follow Jesus is a choice to say, I would rather know my Saviour and become like Him. We know what he chose. He chose relationship with Christ and not his reputation. Having been a Christian for several decades, um, I look back at my Christian life, I look back at my life in ministry, and I've come to this conclusion at this point in my life, that the Christian life is really about learning to impute the right value to the things of God. Daily, you and I are being told what is important and what is valuable by society, by parents, by popular culture, by financial forces, by world leaders, by market forces. We are being told what's important and what's valuable. And then there is the Word of God and the Spirit of God telling us what is important, what is truly valuable. And the entire Christian life, to me, is about learning you know, at every juncture what is valuable and what is important. If this is the case, then what do we do? What can help us to learn to impute value, the right value to the things of God? How do we navigate this, this confusing world that we find ourselves in? I've chosen a passage from Hebrews 11 to take us through. Hebrews 11, you will recall, is the hall of faith. It talks about all the heroes of the faith who have gone before us. And I've chosen a passage that talks about Moses. So let me read it to you in Hebrews 11, starting from verse 23. And as we read this verse, consider what were the choices before Moses, right? By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, Choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Now I pause here. In verse 23, we are introduced to Moses' parents. Now what were the options available to them? At the time that Moses was born, you will recall that the Pharaoh wanted to kill all Hebrew sons. All Hebrew male infants had to be killed by his order. So his parents had to decide, do we listen to the king and kill our son? 
Or do we just take the risk of whatever will happen, will happen, and we try to save our son? They were able to make the right decision to save the life of Moses because they were not afraid of the king's edict. They were not afraid. And the first point I have for us to reflect on is that if we are to learn to impute value, the right value to the right things, at some point we have to deal with our fears. The fears that bring us confusion, the fears that cloud our judgment such that we cannot think straight about what is truly valuable. Now at this juncture, this could be a whole sermon by itself or even a series to talk about fears and how we deal with our fears. And as I was preparing for this, I was reminded of, of all places, of all materials, a children's book. A children's book that I read years ago. Now, some of you may, may know my background. I was a missionary in Timor-Leste and I founded a preschool. So in that context, you know, I read children's books. And I got quite familiar with some. And I want to introduce you to this book called We Are Going on a Bear Hunt. Now, there are some young parents here, maybe you are familiar with this story. It's quite a classic, We Are Going on a Bear Hunt. What it is, is the story of a family going on a bear hunt. So they have to go through many obstacles to find a bear, right? And it's, it's a very cute story because it's written in a way to be responsive and you can act, act it out and dramatise it. Now, this is where I need your help. We are going to read this part of this story in a responsive manner, okay? These are the words of the first paragraph. What it is, is you can see that there's an echo going on, right? So, I will read the first line. May I get your help to read the second line, or rather the lines in bold, responsively. Now, my friends, this is a children's story, right? So, you've got to read it with gusto and energy because you're engaging children. Can we try that? Okay, so I read first and then you read what is in bold. Okay, let's try. We're going on a bear hunt. I've got my binoculars. I'm not scared. Ooh, look at that tall, wavy grass. It's so tall. We can't go over it. We can't go under it. We're just going to have to go through it. Swish, 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 swish. You can imagine acting this out yeah, to young children and having a lot of fun. There is a part in this that speaks to me as an adult. We can't go over it. We can't go under it. So many of us spend our lives running away or avoiding what we fear. We avoid difficult conversations. We avoid getting some people upset. And so we skirt topics. We skirt some decisions. We run away. And it would be really tragic to spend our entire lives running away from challenges, from difficult situations, trying to avoid what we fear. So what's the answer? We can't go over it. We can't go under it. What do we do? We got to go through it. We got to go through it. Face our fears. Process our fears. But best of all, we go through it with the Lord. We're not alone in this. If there are fears in your life, clouding your judgment, making it hard for you to think straight, to impute value to the things of God, Today, from this little humble children's story, there's a nugget of wisdom for us to take away. We can't go over it. We can't go under it. We've got to go through it. And best of all, the Lord promises to be with us. On this topic of fear, I also want to share this quote with you. I don't know what you fear. We all have fears. I think it's what it means to be human. And D.L. Moody says this, Our greatest fear should not be failure but succeeding at what doesn't matter. Imagine coming to the end of your life and 
realizing that you have succeeded spectacularly at all the things that don't matter. I think that would be truly tragic. What is it we are really trying to succeed in? What really matters in the eternal scheme of things? How shall we make the right decision so that we succeed at what matters? So let's go back to the text in Hebrew. And I'll continue reading from verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. What were the choices before Moses? He could have continued living as the son, as a prince of Egypt, a life of luxury and comfort and power. He could have just carried on. But at a certain point in time, he decided he would rather identify with his own people who were slaves. And sometimes to make the right decision, it is a willful choice to say, I will identify with God's people who suffer. Scripture has much to say about this point. In Proverbs 31, verse 8, Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. In Galatians 6, verses 9 to 10, Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap, if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity... Let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Friends, as Christians in Singapore, you and I live such peaceful, stable lives. We know nothing of persecution. We know nothing of lack for most of us. It is so easy to forget the sufferings of the Ukrainians. It's so easy to forget the sufferings of those in Myanmar, in Gaza, in Israel. It is so easy to forget that you and I have brothers and sisters in the faith who are suffering. It's so easy to make decisions and choices that totally ignore the plight of these people. Today, I just want to remind us and urge us that we have the freedom to choose to identify with God's people. And it, it might mean different things to different ones. It might mean choosing to give financially. It might mean remembering to pray for them. It might mean advancing or being an advocate for their, for, for their cause. Let's go back to the story in Hebrews 11. Again, we're talking about Moses, right? Reading from verse 26. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. In verse 26, what were the choices before Moses? Again, he could have stayed in Egypt and enjoyed the tremendous wealth that he had as the prince of Egypt. But he decided to leave the palace and to go on into the wilderness having nothing because he was looking to the reward. He could see a certain invisible reward that somehow was more material than the richest in the king's court. And the takeaway for us is that you and I need to intentionally cultivate a longing for eternal rewards. And I use the word cultivate because I don't think it's going to just happen without effort, without intention. That the reward of heaven is, is invisible to the eye often. It's not so tangible as the rewards of this world. And it's going to take spiritual effort and discipline for us to consider and to remember the rewards that are promised us, that await us. In Romans 8, Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption, and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. 
For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Perhaps many of us need to remind ourselves to cultivate that hope of longing for our spiritual reward, for eternal rewards. C.S. Lewis puts it like this, It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. We are far too easily pleased by the fleeting pleasures and the rewards of this life and of this world. And we forget the weight and the glory of what the Lord promises us. It is not that our desires are too strong. Our desires are too weak. We are too easily satisfied by what the world has to offer. Let's go back to the life of Moses, reading from verse 27. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Now, the anger of the king is pretty scary. Somehow, Moses was able to look over that, to not worry about making the king angry because he saw him who is invisible. And this is so many generations before the coming of Christ. Moses could see the God who was invisible. And that allowed him to overcome his fear of the king. I think you and I would all agree that we all need to grow more aware that God is with us. The invisible God is with us always at all times. Whatever it is you are going through, whatever fears you may be facing, God is with us. He says in Isaiah 43, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. The Lord is with us. Some years ago, when I was still serving as a missionary, I was then the executive director of the NGO, and I was going to make a decision that would have far-reaching consequences. I was going to choose one way and reject another way. And being the leader, I, everyone would follow me, and I knew it would really alter our future, right? And the weight of that decision was really heavy on my heart. And in that context, you know, of trying to discern God's will for us, as I pondered the choices, God gave me a text from Exodus 14 when Moses and the people of Israel are at the edge of the Red Sea. The armies of Pharaoh are chasing them, and in front of them is the Red Sea. There's really not many options available at this point. But Moses has a revelation. And he says to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. I felt this was a word of the Lord for me at that time, to fear not, to make the choice that was in my heart to make. And God was promising that he would, with, he would be with us and take us through the Red Sea, open the way for us to go forward. So this verse has been very special to me in terms of having a sense of the presence of God with us. Subsequently, I commissioned this verse, put it in a plaque. It still hangs in our premise in, in Dili. If you were ever to go, you would see it there. And it's the verse that says, Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. My friends, I don't know what you are going through today. What fears may be in your heart? What are some important critical choices that you are weighing up? We will always choose what is more valuable to us. 
And the Christian life is about learning to decide what is the right value of each thing, each option. What is the right value that we should put on spiritual things? And I've given you some takeaways to think about that at some point we have to deal with our fears. We have to face our fears. Because you can't go over it, you can't go under it, you got to go through it. Sometimes we just need to make a choice, identify with God's people and God's mission in the world. We can cultivate a longing for spiritual and eternal rewards and become more and more aware that God is with us in all circumstances, in all the challenges that you are going through. And so today the message is freedom to choose. We have the freedom to choose. As we sing the response song, I would just like to ask you to open your hearts and invite the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Where you are in life now is largely a result of all the choices you have made plus all the things that you cannot control, right? There's that element too. What is before you? What are some choices that are before you? What are your struggles in putting value to the right things? As we sing this song, may I just invite you to respond to the Lord? And particularly if you, today you have decided, I'm going to face this fear. I've been running away for so long, trying to avoid some difficult situations. But today I just want to make a commitment. I'm going to face this fear together with the Lord. The altar is open. Please come for prayer. And as we sing this song, I also want to invite couples, parents, to pray together. Right, at the right time, pray together with your spouse. It's not easy leading a family. It's not easy leading your children. May the Lord give you grace to make the right choices. Right, shall we rise and send, sing this response song? Open up your hearts and let the Spirit minister to you and speak to you. Jesus, all for Jesus.
we want to say to the Lord, I'm going to face it with you. I'm going to walk through it. I don't want to run away. Please come and let somebody pray with you. Also for those of you who may perhaps look back and have regrets, and you feel guilty because you have made bad choices, I pray for the Holy Spirit to touch you, for the forgiveness of Christ to touch your heart. He can make all things new. He can redeem your past, your, your mistakes. And to the parents here, to the spouses, if you're here with your spouse, would you also take some time to pray together for the wisdom of God, for the grace of God to lead your family, to make the right choices for your family, for your marriage, for your children. All right, so let's spend time with the Lord. Continue to allow the Spirit to minister to you. that you see every heart that is surrendered to you. I pray for grace and strength and for wisdom and clarity, God, to understand value 
and to impute and ascribe value to the right things. And where we struggle, God, it is not about us trying harder. It is just coming in humble repentance and saying, help, help me. It's not trying harder. Help us, all of us, God. Give us the mind of Christ, the wisdom of Christ. Give us eyes to see Him who is invisible. So we give you our hearts. We say you are Lord, Lord of our lives, Lord of our marriages, our relationships, our families and our children. Help us, Lord, to, to make godly choices moment by moment. To make choices that please you and honour you. Yeah, we thank you, Lord. Thank you.